All right, Professor Flores. So for the second part of this interview, we're going to talk more about uh, your personal journey in philosophy mm -hmm. and how it relates to this course. Um, so to start with this, we'd like to know what made you follow an academic career philosophy in the first place? What actually got you to this point? Well, actually, I always wanted, when I first learned about uh, the word philosophy and, and philosophers, then, then my dream was to be a philosopher myself one day, mm -hmm. but I didn't have the, uh, a very, uh, the shortest route to that, so because, okay. yeah. <laughs> but that's what was my, my dream, to, uh, to, I like books, I like thinking, and I like talking, and well, I, I'm paid for all three of them now. Okay, um, so what would you say is your favorite part about teaching, and in contrast, what is your least favorite part? Well, let's start with the least favorite part. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's just, of course, but it's, I'm not complaining about it, but you ask what the... Yeah, what the yeah, yeah. But there, with all, there's the administrative part and there is the um, uh, grading. I, I like the grading, but the amount of grading can bear because if the mm. number of students increases, then, then and it gets a little bit tedious. Uh, so, but uh, the things I like most is, is um, to see and help students develop themselves, and I can uh, and I can see also the difference uh, from the starting at the, at the end. Uh, that students, well, they they get enthusiastic. They are, sometimes they're struggling. They you can see them learning. Uh, sometimes I can see years later. I got messages from students where they are. Oh, so so okay. and that, so that's what I like that. that um, that we together, I hope to help others, people also help to create a better world. And was there ever a moment in your teaching experience that you really felt that the strongest, that, that you could look back and say, this was a moment that I really, really made someone change or, or some impact? Well, there's this, I got a, an email by a student from Norway, and it was years later, I, I did not particularly remember that student, and then she wrote to me, um, at first I thought you were crazy. And then she said, I still think you are, uh, but now I'm, uh, I've turned a vegan and I'm part of the uh, vegan society here in wow. uh, Norway. Okay. So uh, that's interesting that people, yeah. and sometimes it takes time and um, yeah, that, uh, that's nice. So then on the topic of helping others to, to grow personally, uh, what would you say was the single biggest step that you've taken in your personal life to try to lead the most ethical life that you can? Uh, well, yeah, well, I made incremental changes, but I think indeed the, the biggest change that I made was, was when I, I um, turned vegan. And also, that's also, I learned from my own course, because when I mm. started to teach this course, I was a vegetarian and, you know, going steps towards veganism, but I was not a vegan. But then when I show, I told students every year and, and, and included also the, about the dairy industry and the show their movies, and then say, why am I not, why am I continuing to be a vegetarian? So that's weird. So that's mm -hmm. actually, by teaching, I'm also learning. So it, it was quite a shock for me, looking back that, that, well, that I was taking my own class, right? I was yeah. looking at my own arguments. So um, yeah, that was, I think, the, probably the biggest step in my personal uh, lifestyle. And do you find that taking that step has made you more conscious of how you can help others to develop themselves and not just in let's say going towards veganism but in improving their lives as an ethical person in, in any facet well, yeah well it makes me more i'm usually when i'm explaining to others i'm a little bit um, um impatient but then mm -hmm. when i think about my own steps then i think okay maybe i should be much more patient in other people uh, that it takes time for a change, also time to, that it really, it's not only the rational argument, it's, it's uh, our psychological layout is more difficult than that. And that's kind of frustrating for a philosopher, but then, I, you know, I'm, I'm not the ideal philosopher myself because it also took me a long time, so. Mm -hmm. And are there still any parts of uh, your current identity that, that if you reflect on it from a philosophical perspective, yes. you might say it's inconsistent or... Yeah, so I'm, I'm a vegan, and, uh, but I know I should be an ego-vegan. Ego, mm -hmm. It means that, that my ecological footprint is still too large, so, so that's one thing. Mm -hmm. um, working on it, but not 
not good enough. So that might be something that I'd be ashamed of in a few uh, later, <laughs> looking back at now. Mm -hmm. And the second thing that my effective altruism, that the way that I help others by, by money, time and effort uh, can still be much more improved uh, than that I do now. So taking this idea of, of improving yourself, could you extrapolate it and, and maybe talk about what is the biggest potential that we have as a human society to, to, to do or to create? It's kind of an abstract question, I know, but, but what do you, or you could even rephrase it as, what is the biggest waste of human potential that we have right now? Well, if you form it like that, the biggest waste of human potential, I'm going to give a politically incorrect answer. Okay. Uh, but that would be a religion. Uh, mm -hmm. The biggest waste of human potential religion generally limits people's possibilities emotionally, intellectually, and morally. So, mm -hmm. so I mean, there are many other obstacles, but religion is worldwide one of the biggest waste of human potential ever. And so, so I do hope also that that this course helps people to be much more critical about religion than generally people are uh, because of this argument which I just said. So would you, would you say or do you think is religion obsolete or how would you define it? Well, I think religion always has been obsolete. Mm. Uh, so, but yeah, what, what, that's also the question, what is religion? Okay, but generally in our society in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. um, religion is very liberal and it doesn't interfere with science so much. So it's, so I'm not, so it's not so much an obstacle, but worldwide it is. Mm -hmm. um, but because many intellectuals, they just look at the liberal religions around them and they extrapolate that to religion as a whole, that, that blurs their vision that religion is an obstacle for human development. And I think that's a pity because as mm -hmm. a philosopher, my main message is, my main focus is to focus on victims. And so I'm trying to, to help victims not to be a victim. And, to, and if you look at humans and the human potential, I'd like to f that all humans can flourish, including women, including homosexuals. And mm. in many countries, due to religion, that's not the case. And have you, as an individual, ever struggled with a religious identity or, or trying to shed that? Or has that not been a part of your life? Well, I've been brought up as a Catholic, but as a liberal Catholic, so I, I'm not traumatized in any, not that I know of. Okay. I'm not mm. angry personally at what I experienced, so it's not like, um, so, so also, so I participated in, in it when I was till about into my adolescent years, but I don't think I ever believed in it or something like mm. it, so it just, just, just was part of my social surroundings. And then when I thought about it, when, when I was, I think, starting to get intellectual mature when I was studying, and then I thought, okay, uh, I am an atheist. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Would, given that, would you have any advice to students who take this course and who might feel um, uncomfortable because they've been brought up in a more stringent religious background? Is there anything you could say to them to, to uh, help them uh, understand this course or at least grow from it in any way that they can? Yeah. Well, one of the things is I'm not angry at them personally or something like that. So it's not, mm. um, and it's their own choice. So, so, that's, so they have to struggle with it or, or they can just, just neglect it if they want. So they, they are adults now. Uh, but also the, one of the, the whole idea that university should be a place that you can, that you're not being questioned. I think that whole idea you can, I think university should be a place where you are challenged even your most cherished beliefs, mm -hmm. that you find people who have totally different opinions that it, and they challenge you and that you have to learn to, to give arguments for your beliefs. So, so this maybe, peop, I don't think it's a problem that people think they feel uncomfortable. So that, that's part of, 
that's what universities should be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but it, of course, it's up to them. I'm not forcing any students uh, to... Uh, so, so given that then, um, what would you add or change to this course uh, if there was no institutional constraints on it? So if it was not just at a university level, but more of an open society uh, structured course where you could put in anything you wanted to really have the full impact you could on the students? Well, one of the things what I really miss in education at university is it's at a massive scale. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I don't know the majority of my students. And so I'd like to have them smaller, in an ideal world, smaller groups mm -hmm. and longer um, that we can work together. Right? Because it's 10 weeks, it's actually it's not, it's just, it's so, it's so little. So yeah. it's so uh, I would prefer to have it longer to and also to not have it limited to classroom settings. So I'd like to to go to outside with students to 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 socialize well to have structured more socialized meetings uh, than only classroom meetings mm -hmm. so that we can really grow together. One of the things that I do in the master class, master course, for example, and there the group is much smaller, is we go on a two-day excursion, which is called a workshop, mm -hmm. uh, where we indeed do all these things. And that's usually a very wonderful experience. Because one of the things which I dislike, although I, I'm partly to blame for that, that it's me talking, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and there's not so much interaction and there's not so much input from the students, uh, only the assignments. And in an ideal world, that would be much more. But, but I'm aware you need to first to have some level of knowledge and, and tools. Mm -hmm. and, but it's usually we, now we reach that level and then we quit. So as this knowledge is developing during the course, would you encourage student dialogue more than, than typical numbers? Would I, well, I would hope that, that the, I'm still looking on experimenting with uh, different kind of innovations in education that, mm. that it could be more, um, uh, um, the student could interact more with each other. And uh, because it, I like it that they, that, that students themselves discuss these themes and not just ask me, I'm not, I'm not a preacher, right? So, yeah. so, the, so they have to, think for the themselves on a, on a level playing ground. Yeah. Okay, and just as, as a final um, uh, question, do you have any recommendations for students with this course as far as what you've experienced in your own uh, reading books or watching documentaries of what they can do to kind of uh, develop their own knowledge about the material outside of the course? Yeah, actually, you, that, the, actually that's, that's a good that you bring it in because what I hope with this course that this is the beginning of a philosophical journey of a mm -hmm. part of, of that you take philosophy with you in the rest of your life. So that you, that if there is something in this course, and that's why I give a lot of videos, uh, books, um, uh, and suggestions that you, you, you take one of, of two of these and that you explore it yourself. If you, if you think Peter Singer is interesting, that you start to look TED Talks by Peter Singer, or, or, or if you think Richard Dawkins is interesting, that you... So I would like to motivate students to go further. Uh, so okay. that's also this idea of, of building and, and lifelong learning. So I really like to make them enthusiastic. That's why I also bring a lot of books. Well, it doesn't have to be only books, but I'd like mm. to that people, it's not about getting a grade and, and reading the mandatory reading. It's something that it's the beginning of a journey. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I hope everyone else can enjoy the start of their build with this course. I hope so too.